Okay. So, um, so um, Martin's going to kick off now the this, the, um, the, um, the the workshop after Robert Lang's excellent, I think, introductory summary of the field um, with low excitation and high excitation radio galaxies and X-ray perspective. Martin Hardcastle. Thanks. Have a light. All right. Okay, well, um, thanks, Robert, for uh, saying about half of what I'm going to say. Um, I guess the advantage of this is that uh, the, the material isn't going to be completely new to you. Um, so the organizers asked me to talk about low excitation and high excitation at an X-ray perspective, and I decided that was a little bit too narrow, so I'm going to talk about the whole thing. Uh, and here's the, the basic sketch of what I'm going to do. Um, the observational history, where did this terminology come from and what we actually see. Uh, what the evidence is for the two accretion modes. Robert's already told you this is true. Um, the models for this, uh, so is it about accretion of hot gas or is it just about um, the rate at which you accrete things? Um, and then I'm going to, going to talk a little bit about something Robert didn't actually mention, which is um, predictions of these models for observables like host galaxy properties. So um, let's start at the beginning. Um, we know, we've already heard that um, this, this Heg and Leg, Herg and Lerg um, division is identified through, uh, was originally identified through optical lines like these ones. So um, if you look at a high excitation object, you may see, um, you'll, certain, you'll, you'll always see narrow lines like these ones. You may see some broad lines as well. Um, narrow line radio galaxies will just have the narrow lines and no broad H alpha. Um, low excitation radio galaxies, you've already seen this exact spectrum, um, don't really show anything. There may be some weak low excitation lines and no high excitation strong lines. So the optical spectra are very different. And this was just a thing that we were all told um, in the 1990s. One of the things you have to know about radio galaxies, nobody seemed to put it into any context of the active nucleus, models of the active nucleus. Um, uh, to give you an idea of the demographics, here's 3CRR, um, colour-coded by their, uh, their source type and their emission line type. So the green things are the low excitation radio galaxies. I'm going to call them LURGs pretty much throughout. So you can see mostly they're at low, they're at low redshift, low radio power. These two things are correlated in this plot, of course. Um, uh, and as you go to high powers, you get quasars, and almost exclusively quasars and narrow-line radio galaxies. There are some low excitation objects up here. How real these are, I wouldn't want to say. Um, but the important thing to notice is that although right at the low redshift end, what you mostly see is low excitation FR1s, there is a large population in 3C, 3CRR of low excitation FR2s. So straight away, um, we see that this, this has never been the FR1, FR2 dichotomy. We knew this. We knew this in the 1980s, that these two things are not the same. Um, so a substantial scattering up here where you have um, narrow line radio galaxies and low excitation radio galaxies mixed together. Um, it was the fact that I did my PhD on this redshift range that brought me into contact with these things. <clears throat> and there's nothing special about the low excitation FR2 radio galaxies. If I show you a picture of two radio galaxies in that redshift range. These are both 3CRR objects taken from that, that range where they overlap. One of those is a low excitation radio galaxy, and one of those is a high excitation radio galaxy, but I would bet that probably only Robert can tell me which one is which with 100% accuracy. You can't tell by looking at the radio map. You have to tell by memorizing what they all look like. Um, <clears throat> that one's a low excitation one. That one's a high excitation one. All right, so, um, so we have these two different emission line classes producing apparently identical radio structures. Um, now, we sort of sorted out the basics of this orientation-based unified model in the 1990s, and you'll still see people putting up these slides when they, this particular picture, it's a beautiful picture, it explains a lot. Um, whenever, whenever somebody talks about radio galaxies, they'll start dragging this in. But there's a very important thing that you need to know about it, which is that low excitation radio galaxies don't fit on this picture. And since most radio galaxies in the universe are low excitation radio galaxies, you really need to be very careful about putting this picture up and saying, we know what's going on. 
Um, the argument is that either low excitation radio galaxies intrinsically have no narrow line region, in which case they don't sit on this plot because um, you can't unify with quasars, which always do have a narrow line, narrow lines, and so must have a narrow line region. Or else, this, this was a possibility back in the 90s, um, the, in low excitation objects, the narrow line region is there, but it's really heavily obscured and you can't see it. But in that case, you still can't unify with quasars because we know they're not really heavily obscured. Um, so um, you have to treat the low excitation objects as a, as a um, completely separate, non-unified population. And it was realized a long time ago that if you did that, actually, it solved some problems. The numbers didn't really work out for the orientation-based <coughs> unified schemes at low luminosities, and that's because of this contamination with lurgs, and you get rid of the lurgs, and then the narrow-line radio galaxies and the broad-line radio galaxies and the quasars all, all work, and, and this picture does, in fact, work. <coughs> um, so that's the, that's the emission line classification. Now, what, when this got more interesting was when we started to look at these objects in other wave bands. At least, when I say it got more interesting, I got more interested in it when we started to look at them in other wave bands. Uh, so to cut a fairly long story short, the the observational evidence looks a bit like this. If you look at the X-ray spectrum of um, a narrow line radio galaxy, what you, what you see is a heavily obscured accretion related component. So this is the accretion, this is the, 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 basically the X-ray emission from near the accretion disk, the so-called corona, being heavily obscured by a torus. The properties of that torus are exactly what unified models tell you they should be. Um, you also see a soft X-ray component, which isn't obscured, which we attribute to um, the jet itself. So that's pretty much universal in all radio galaxies. Um, and so when you put those two things together, you see a spectrum which goes down and has a dip in the middle and then goes up again. And sometimes you'll see a narrow um, um, iron line and so on in, this, in these narrow line radio galaxies as well. Um, when you look at low excitation radio galaxies, all you see is a power law. You don't see any evidence for this accretion related component. So from that, you can conclude either it isn't there or it's extremely heavily obscured. And by heavily obscured, I mean Compton thick. It has to be so obscured you can't <coughs> see it. Um, the, incidentally, these, these soft power law components that we see in both classes of object, you can't tell those apart. They seem to be related to the jet. They, they have an obvious correlation with the radio <coughs> core. Um, and there's no difference between those and their narrow line and, and uh, radio galaxies and the low excitation radio galaxies. In quasars, these two components get mixed up, so it gets a bit messy. <coughs> okay, um, and so here's a, so here's a summary of where we are with the, with the X-ray uh, work on this. These, this is the, the, our latest large sample paper. Um, my, my former PhD student um, looking at the luminosity of the accretion-related X-ray emission uh, as a function of radio luminosity, and you can see the, for narrow line radio galaxies, they, they, there's a reasonable sort of there is a reasonable correlation. The low excitation radio galaxies are all limits, or almost all limits, and they're all lying below that correlation. So we can say either there is no accretion-related emission from these things, or else it's it's so heavily obscured. This, these these limits are obviously based on a particular assumption about the obscuration. If we if we assume they're very very heavily obscured, we can bring them back. We can bring the low excitation objects back in line. So. <clears throat> From the X-ray evidence alone, you don't know whether the low excitation objects are intrinsically different in terms of their accretion state or just obscured. Uh, to finally sew this up, you go to the mid-infrared. Um, so this is work that's being done by pointing things like Spitzer or WISE at large samples of radio galaxies. Um, <clears throat> and when you do that, you see the same picture. So remember that one possibility was that just the lows were just very heavily obscured. But if, you, if that was the case, all that emission, all that Obscured emission would be coming out in the mid-infrared. You'd expect them to have the same torus properties as um, the narrow line radio galaxies. But again, systematically, and this is a this is a, a wise paper for a compilation of radio samples, we find that the um, the torus luminosities again are mostly limits, and they're all lying below the limits for objects of the same radio power um, that we get from the, 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 that have narrow lines. So these objects basically appear to have the conventional apparatus of a torus and an accretion disk and the low, low excitation objects. Basically, it doesn't seem to work. That, it must either be very much less luminous for a given radio power or absent altogether. So, 
The way we choose to interpret this is, is as Robert said, as a different accretion mode. So we say there is no radiatively efficient accretion in the low excitation objects, and lots and lots of people have been saying this over the years. What this means then, um, first of all, the idea that you need to omit your low excitation objects from unified, from orientation based unified models is true in that case. There's, um, it doesn't make any sense to be treating these in the same way as, as the high excitation objects. A point Robert's already made, but I think is very important because it must be telling us something about jet generation, is that we can, jet, we can generate jets, identical jets effectively, in terms of their radio properties, both with and without a radiatively efficient disk. Therefore, the disk is not making the jets. Um, and this has very important implications also for population studies, because once you're, uh, if you're doing surveys of large samples of radio galaxies, uh, you're, you need to be so sure which population you're actually looking at. Um, and this has caused a lot of confusion. I think over the years, people have been looking at low redshift samples and high redshift samples and comparing them, and the low redshift samples will be entirely lurgs and the high redshift samples entirely narrow line objects, and then they find differences and they say this is redshift evolution or something. It doesn't have to be. OK, so what about, how, how do we get this, this difference in the accretion mode? Um, the, Robert touched on this again. The, 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 the fuel sources that people talk about are, you know, in a very crude way, you can divide into cold gas and hot gas, although hot gas is not necessarily hot gas. So on the one hand, you have a situation, um, and maybe, maybe Sene is in this situation as the nearest example of, of an elliptical with a major merger going on. Um, you pull in a lot of cold gas through a gas-rich major merger. You can dump some of that onto the central black hole. You can get accretion, um, and you can drive jets. This is the model um, you know, a lot of optical astronomers subscribe to, or a lot of them are secretly thinking about when they, when they talk about how our AGN are triggered. Um, but from a feedback point of view, there really needs to be a mode, and there certainly seems to be a mode where the accretion is connected to the hot phase in some way. Um, and the evidence for this comes from things like um, Perseus A in the centers of clusters. When you look at the center of a, a cluster with a high cooling rate, um, you find pretty much universally a radio source. There's got to be some connection between the fueling of the radio source and the hot phase. Similarly, the, um, for low excitation objects, at any rate, there's a very strong correlation between the mass of the galaxy and therefore the mass of the hot halo and the prevalence of radio um, emission above a certain uh, radio power. So we have hot gas and cold gas um, being connected to the, 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 the formation of the jets in some way. Um, <clears throat> now, some while ago, it was fashionable to talk about Bondi accretion, i.e. direct accretion from the hot phase as a means of powering radio sources. And the fashion, I think, came from a paper by Steve Allen in 2006, where he showed, or he argued, perhaps we should say, that there was a very strong correlation between the inferred jet power and the, uh, the, the Bondi accretion power in, an, in a small sample of radio galaxies. And it's, it's a remarkably good correlation that was found here. Um, these are all nearby radio galaxies where you can resolve the Bondi radius with Chandra, so you've got some idea of what the Bondi rate is, and you can see cavities so that you can estimate the, um, the jet power. So <clears throat> at that stage, it looked really promising to say Bondi accretion is your connection between the hot phase and the cold and, 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 and the, the jet. You get Bondi accretion, somehow that get, the, the accreted material generates a jet, and off you go. Um, and when you look at the uh, pro properties of the radio samples and say what could be powered by Bondi, then on some admittedly fairly simple assumptions, we showed that the low excitation type objects could be powered by Bondi accretion from some sort of vaguely plausible environment, but the high excitation ones <coughs> definitely couldn't. Um, they need, they, they, they can't, you know, the, the hot gas is not sufficient to, to power their, their jets. And this is only talking about powering the jets, incidentally, not the, the radiation. So um, the, the story that we then came up with was, what if there is actually one-to-one -one connection between the fueling source and the, um, the accretion mode? So what if 
you accrete hot gas and that makes you into a lurg. And if you accrete cold gas, it makes you into a, a herg, an, a narrow line object. Um, the argument, there wasn't, there was an argument here. I mean, it was, it was more a sort of what if this was true? Let's see what the consequences were. But there was an argument based on the idea that if you're bondy accreting, you can't form a, radi a, a radiatively efficient accretion just because the material you're accreting is too hot um, and a bondy flow never cools down. So, <clears throat> um, and, uh, we thought this was kind of neat because it explained, for example, all these differences that people are seeing between the high, the high redshift and low redshift radio galaxies. On the one hand, you've got the hot gas accretors, and on the other hand, you've got the cold gas accretors. <coughs> um, why is this looking less promising nearly 10 years later than it was at the time? Well, I think several reasons. Firstly, um, I think Bondi accretion may not work. Physically, it may not work. It's not really obvious that you can get a nice smooth bondy flow without getting all sorts of cooling instabilities. As soon as you get, um, uh, I, I, so I mean, the, the power necessary for some of these sources is probably too high anyway um, for bondy to supply it. Uh, the, um, another thing that's happened is that people have reanalyzed the work of Allen et al. 2006 and they've looked at larger samples and that beautiful correlation has more or less gone away. Um, and in fact, it's you know, it's really not obvious where it came from in the first place. Um, so <coughs> that really throws a spanner in the original motivation. Now, the sort of thing that people tend, are now thinking about is a more sophisticated picture where you, okay, you still have the hot phase, but rather than trying to directly accrete the hot phase, um, you can have um, cooling instabilities. I mean, obviously, the hot phase isn't completely uniform. You will have cooling instabilities. Cooling instabilities um, they give rise to a kind of rain of cold material. So you think about a cooling instability, you rapidly get cold material with very low angular momentum because it's just come out of the hot halo. What it's going to do is fall inwards. Um, these show some numerical models of that sort of thing going on. When, you, when that sort of thing, when, when the, this cold material falls in, it can easily accrete onto the zagreb supermassive black hole. It, it, it will find it hard to avoid. In the process of falling in, it can generate the, the, the cold gas and molecular material that we very often see in the middle of hot, hot clusters, which, is, which has always been a little bit confusing. But it also supplies um, a, a, a fuel source for accretion, which is still connected to the cooling rate and therefore still useful in feedback models, um, but, um, but isn't a direct accretion from the hot phase. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, I think we can more or less dispense with the idea that the, the, the accretion from the hot phase directly forces an object to be a lurg and vice versa. Um, what we've got instead, I think the model that, that works best now is just that it's simply about an accretion rate switch. So it's all about are you above or below a certain critical accretion rate threshold and scaled in terms of the, the Eddington rate. rate. So <clears throat> here's what I consider the best evidence that this is true. Um, this is again from, our, from Beatrice Mingo's recent work um, a couple of years ago. This is, this is for the three CRR and two Jansky samples again. So it's taking well-known radio galaxies and we're asking what is, what's, the, um, what's the accretion, the total accretion rate as a function of Eddington. So this includes the total, the total accretion rate here is basically, um, sorry, this is the, the total, um, the Eddington luminosity and the, and the um, disk and jet luminosity is all bundled together right? because the, the accretion has still got to power the, the jet. So we, we take a best estimate of the jet kinetic luminosity, we take our best estimate of the, um, the, accre the, the uh, radiative luminosity where we've got it, um, and then we plot all these up for the high excitation and the low excitation objects, and the theoretical transition um, is at a few percent Eddington, and that's pretty much where the population swap over. Now it's not, it's not perfect, there are some lurgs here that, that appear to have higher, um, substantially higher fractional accretion rates, 10% Eddington. Uh, it's easy to get around that because black hole mass estimates are very, very fluffy here and also jet power estimates are very, very fluffy and for the lurgs, this is all driven by the jet power. So I'm not too worried about that. But I think the, the evidence for a transition is quite good. There's also some work by, by Philip Best um, doing the same thing with, with O3, um, the reason that I I, I, I think that's less good is that he divided up the sample into lurgs and hergs based on the O3 properties and then drew this diagram. Uh, so there's a, you kind of there's a selection effect introducing the dichotomy, but these things are 
This is an unbiased sample and it shows the same thing. <clears throat> okay, so the way I would look at this now is that if you've got a low excitation radio galaxy, what's going to happen is it's going to be associated with a, a massive galaxy because that implies a massive black hole, which um, means that the Eddington switch is at lower luminosities and or lower, lumen, lower accretion rates. Therefore, it's quite natural for most LURGs to still be driven by hot gas accretion from the intercluster medium, from stellar winds and so on, uh, because that's one way of guaranteeing a, very, a fairly low accretion rate, except in the most, uh, the, the, the most strongly cooling systems. On the other hand, high excitation objects, you need to get L over L ed, reason, or M dot over M dot ed, if you like, higher. So you can do that by having a lower mass galaxy, therefore a, a lower mass black hole, or by having a higher accretion rate. Um, and so there's going to be a natural association between those things and um, the accretion of merger supplied cold gas, because that's a way of getting the accretion rate up. Um, so you'd have a statistical association between the two fueling sources and the two accretion modes, but not a one-to-one -one -one correlation, as, as we suggested in 2007. The, com the predictions, which are basically about populations, ought still to hold good. OK, so predictions are low excitation radio galaxies should favor massive galaxies, rich environments, no reason for, to expect merger signatures, low star formation rates, because these things will be in rich environments, which suppresses star formation, um, weak evolution with cosmic time, because um, it, the, 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 the um, cooling rate doesn't depend very much on cosmic time out to reasonable redshifts. High excitation objects will favor lower, lower mass galaxies, poorer environments, higher merger rates, higher star formation rates, <clears throat> um, and should evolve strongly with cosmic time because the merger rate evolves strongly with cosmic time. And OK, so just running through some of these things very briefly to show that this is, this is all working out so far. Um, at a given radio power, high excitation radio galaxies do indeed occupy less massive galaxies than high, low excitation radio galaxies. So here are the Hergs, here are the Lurgs. This is Best and Heckman, 2012, a very large sample. Um, and the black hole masses are lower as well. Um, so, OK, prediction one, that works. Interaction and merger signatures. This, is, this has been a very vexed topic over the years. People have claimed you know, that, that you, see, you see strong merger signatures or that you don't see any merger signatures at all in radio loud AGN. Um, there will be some recent work on the Tujanski sample, which shows quite conclusively, I think, that the narrow line radio galaxies show significantly enhanced mer merger fractions relative to a, a com um, comparison population of elliptical galaxies. The lobes don't. So um, that's working really well. Um, the narrow line radio galaxies are the ones where we think we need to deliver a high accretion rate. Um, and you have the mergers there to provide the, the gas that you need. Um, uh, Sarah Ellison's done some nice work recently showing that, if, that you, you, there's basically no evidence for merger stroke interaction triggering of LURGs in a very large sample at all. Um, LURGs are just normal galaxies, effectively. Star formation, this is something that we've been doing with Herschel data, um, us and various other people. Um, so here is, so this is basically what we're seeing here is redshift for um, a sample in the um, H atlas fields, and this is the uh, so these are, these are this is these are redshift bins that we're seeing here, and then this is the infrared luminosity, which is a proxy of star formation rate, um, divided into Hergs this time green and Lurgs this time blue, uh, and a comparison sample of normal galaxies in orange, and you can see that basically the Lurgs are compatible with or even a little lower than the comparison sample of normal galaxies in terms of star formation rate. The, the, the Hergs are always higher. So high excitation radio galaxies are associated with enhanced star formation rate uh, at any given redshift. Now that's only matching in redshift, but we can also do things like matching in mass, uh, mass and AGN power. So this is a, this is a mass, mass, match, blah, 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 mass matched, AGN power matched sample of Hergs and Lurgs and also some radio quiet AGN. And you can see that even there, the, 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 um, the difference persists although not at huge significance, because once you mass match, you tend to throw away most of your objects. Um, but we're reasonably convinced that, that this is still there. Uh, also notice that typical radio quiet AGN have significantly higher star formation rates. That's because they're not usually in ellipticals. Environment, um, well, the, envi the environment evidence is, is still a bit ratty here, um, I think. But um, for example, uh, 
some work that Cyril Tass did a few years ago. Basically, what we're seeing here is, is an over-density plot um, as a function of galaxy mass. And essentially, he's looking at the Herg and Lurg populations and finding that the Lurgs tend to be in um, more massive environments. Uh, more recently, we tried to do this in the X-ray. And again, the data are pretty ratty, and we don't have as many data points as we'd like. But these are the, this is the X-ray luminosity for a large sample of um, powerful radio galaxies as a function of radio luminosity. The Hergs are the filled points, and the Lurgs are the, the empty points. And you can see the Lurgs are systematically above the Hergs um, in um, X-ray luminosity, so basically a measure of cluster richness um, at all, of, as, you know, across all radio powers. Um, evolutionary predictions, this is a thing where we're not really there yet. Um, you would, so uh, Philip's work um, showed using V over Vmax tests, we, we, we can construct separate luminosity functions for the two populations, and um, we can find that the, the high excitation objects do show signs across the luminosity range for evolving a little bit more strongly than the high excitation, the low excitation ones. What you want to do is have a sample at high redshift um, we do actually have a sample at high redshift. My, my postdoc, Wendy Williams, has got one, but she's not got some, any plots she's willing to show me yet. She says it confirms a trend, but um, watch this space. Um, so, um, <clears throat> looks like a good place to stop. The take-home messages I want, I want you to, to, um, to have from this talk are, um, we think they the Hergs and those really are different accretion modes. There is an important implication for jet generation models. Um, uh, and of course, it's worth bearing in mind, um, this is not really part of the talk, but it's an it's, it's important fact about high excitation objects. Um, there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between the uh, radiative power and the jet power. There is in 3C-type in, in objects, as uh, Rawlings and Saunders sh showed many years ago, but that's, I think, a selection effect based on the fact that you, you're selecting the most powerful radio objects. Um, if you look um, at other types of objects. There's a very large range in, in jet power to radiative power for those objects. So other controlling parameters must be involved, like black hole spin, like the accretion, the advection rate of um, magnetic field onto the system. Um, <coughs> accretion to which model works, so that's what you should believe now. Um, still consistent with the predictions of the hot and cold accretion mode, um, but a slightly different mechanism. All these differences about uh, in, the, in the environments in the host galaxy properties imply that Lurgs are not just switched off Hergs. This is, I get this quite often. People say, well, it's, it's, they are really just Hergs, but the nucleus is temporarily off, and that fools you. Some, some Lurgs probably are actually relics. Things we call Lurgs are probably switched off, relic, um, switch, switched off Hergs. Most of them can't be. Otherwise, these, these differences wouldn't exist. Where do we go from here? I think we need to be able to classify Hergs and Lurgs in a robust way in the very large samples that we're going to get from you know, the, 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 the new, radio, new gener generation of radio instruments and um, deep optical surveys, that's difficult you, because the traditional method, spectroscopic classification, relies on getting a spectrum of everything, and that is really challenging. So maybe things like um, mid-infrared properties are the way to go with this. Once we've done that, we should be able to solve some of these evolution problems. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Hi, um, I'm Ritavan Chatterjee. Um, so we, in the, in the micro quasars, for example, we do see uh, that how the jet behaves has a very clear, seems to be clear connection with the accretion rate. Yes. So uh, what's your comment on that connecting with this? Well, um, I mean, the, the, the naive answer is it doesn't work. Right. They, they, they are not behaving the same. I think the less naive answer is, um, again, something Robert mentioned, <clears throat> it's, it may be possible in, in AGN to have a radiatively efficient outer disk that's still going and still have um, the jet generation mechanism going on in the middle. So you take, a, you take a chunk out of the central disk and it may be that you don't see that behavior in um, microquasars simply because you don't have the you know, the disks are physically different. You're talking about different size scales. Um, so you may still have the, 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 the what, what, what in a microquasar would be the, the low hard state in the middle of the disk while having a radiatively efficient um, outer disk. 
or it may be that the, there's, a, there's a very, very short duty cycle that, um, and we're averaging over those things and we don't, we don't notice. Um, but there isn't, I mean, you, you, people have tried to make this analogy. I mean, it, it's actually out there in the literature, you know, um, quasar mode, radio mode, right? That's based on the false analogy between um, micro quasars and AGN. And it assumes you're either generating a jet or you have a radiatively efficient accretion disk, but not, not both. We've known that's, that's nonsense, right? There are radio loud quasars. We know that. Um, we can't, we can't, that we, we, we've got to do better than that analogy. One more question. Denise? Okay, um, in, the, in the two types of objects, would the different nature of the accretion require different jet launching mechanisms, or could the same, like a magnetic launching mechanism, work for both? Yeah, I, th I think my answer to that is almost the same as the, the, the previous question. I think you can, you've got, if, you can make, if you want to make a magnetic um, launching mechanism work for, work for both, you need to have a means of allowing a radiatively efficient accretion disk to exist in the presence of that sort of mechanism. But that's okay if, for example, the outer disk can be a fairly regular radiatively efficient disk and the inner disk can be truncated by the effects of magnetic field, for example. Because yeah. whatever scheme is, is sort of devised to explain that the, the situation, you have to explain the fact that you do actually get jets that actually look very similar. Yeah, I, well, I, that, that, that's, that's, yeah that, that is something we really have to explain. Um, a, a, a model, for example, that relies on generating the, the jet from the disk I think cannot possibly work in the case of Lurgs because there isn't one. Um, so those models really struggle. Uh, sorry, we'll have to stop there and move on to the next speaker. So. Just, just one, 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 one comment. Uh, actually, if you, I, I will be talking about this on Friday. If you cool the disk, uh, the jet doesn't get switched off. Uh, the disk becomes filamentary, hot phase, cold phase. At the same time and the same at the same radii, it just it's all mixed up. Uh, so um, that seems like it can reproduce the spectral signature and also can give you a jet uh, while the disk is radiatively efficient. Um, so that could be uh, why the jets are similar because the jet is coming from black hole and all you need from the disk is to hold the flux on the black hole. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Let's thank Mark very much once again.